Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good evening and welcome to Zion Temple's uh, live uh, Sunday School Youth Teen Edition. So praise the Lord. We're gonna first. I'm gonna begin by having a word of prayer. So bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for your grace and mercy, Lord, your loving kindness, your patience, your long suffering with us. We thank you, Lord God, for another opportunity to come together that we may uh, get your word out, Lord God, and also take it in. We thank you, we love you, and we honor you, O God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So again, praise the Lord. Welcome to Zion Temple Sunday School Youth Teen Edition. Uh, today, uh, April 1st, which the lesson is for this particular Sunday, which is uh, April the 3rd. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Brother Lonnie Baylor, and I'll be the teacher for this evening. So the title of the lesson today <clears throat> is Believing Without Understanding. Believing Without Understanding. And you know, most of us, we only believe what we can see so this is uh it's a stretch even with that so last week we talked about god's presence and his protection no matter what we fight against if we remain close to god he will remain faithful to us and sustain us even when everyone else has left our side so keep that in mind so i'm gonna start here uh with the commentary it says where do we begin it says a group of toddlers decided to hold a convention. They were frustrated with some things around their homes, so they decided to take action and do something about it. One of the toddlers called the meeting to order and began to speak. I was running through the kitchen yesterday after my mommy finished mopping. A spot was still wet, and I slipped and bumped my knee. My knee is starting to bruise today. I don't see any reason for tile flooring. Let's make a rule that all floors in the house must have carpet. None of the toddlers understood how difficult it is to clean carpet, so they all thought carpet in the kitchen was a splendid idea. Having settled on that rule, they moved on to the next one. I was in the living room the other day, the next toddler said. I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing, and I walked into the corner of the coffee table. I hurt myself on that corner. I don't see a reason for square corners. All corners should be round. <laughs> the toddlers didn't know anything about furniture design. They didn't know how bulk, bulky rounded furniture would be or how difficult it might be to take all furniture, to make all furniture round, excuse me. They didn't consider that they could hurt themselves on rounded corners just as well as square ones. They decided this new measure sounded good to them too. The next toddler spoke. I reached into the silverware drawer the other day and my father popped my hand when he saw me reach for a knife. What is the point of keeping eating utensils we aren't even allowed to use? Ban the use of all knives. Again, in their limited understanding, all of this made perfectly good sense. Toddlers, though, do not get to write laws and make policies. Instead, they have to trust that those in higher positions of authority than them have their best interests in mind. I thought that was pretty interesting. And then the last part of that, it's similar uh, with us. Even though we don't get to make or write a lot of the laws and policies, we still have to trust that those in higher positions of authority than us have our best interests in mind. And that goes in, going into politics and who you choose to vote for and things of that nature. And uh, I found out that when they're campaigning, for office, they make a lot of promises, but then when they get into office, those things tend to shift and change, but we're not talking about politics right now. So I'll say that for another day. So in, um, <clears throat> in this uh, particular part of the lesson, it says, where do we go from here? And 
Topic A says the dysfunction of Jacob's family. Have you ever felt like your family may be less than perfect? Have you ever wondered if you were the only one? Many people have some degree of dysfunction in their families. In fact, one of the most important families in the Bible, Jacob's, was full of problems. Number two says right from the beginning, Jacob had a problem because he had two wives. He loved one of his wives, Rachel, much more than he loved the other, Leah. Because of that, he treated the children he had from Rachel better than he did the children from Leah. Number three says, Jacob particularly showed favoritism to his son, Joseph, who was 11th out of 12 sons. Now, that's a big family. Uh, so the scripture text that we're going to be uh, reading from will be from Genesis chapter 37, uh, verses 3 through 5. And uh, we have it here in the King James, but I also have it here in uh, my, my Bible on my phone is set to the, the New and Living Translation. Um, but I'm going to read the King James for your hearing. It says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. So uh, in the National Living Translation, it simply reads a little bit different, and it reads like this. It says, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night Joseph had a dream and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. So um, this is where it began because God had gifted Joseph to dream dreams. Number four says, not only was Joseph celebrated by his father above the rest of his brothers, but he was given a symbol of his father's favoritism, a coat of many colors. If that wasn't bad enough, on top of that, he was a dreamer. Number five says, Joseph dreamed two dreams. A, in the first dream, he saw himself and his brothers in a field creating bundles of wheat. His brother's bundles of wheat bowed down to his bundle. B, in the second dream, he saw the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him. Number six says, these dreams could clearly seem to mean that Joseph's 11 brothers and even his mother and father would bow down before him. Joseph's brothers hated him for this. Not only was Joseph favored by their father, but he was telling them he was going to rule over them. They decided right then that something would have to be done about Joseph. What they did to him proved just how evil and dysfunctional his family was. And on that note, we can also think about in some of our own families, uh, there's a bit of dysfunction, whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, many of our families, we have some sort of dysfunction. Um, yeah, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the Daily Devotion Insight reads like this. It says, the devotional focus this week has to do with our faith and willingness to believe God's promises. God has a very special plan for you and your family. Never doubt what God has promised for you because he is faithful to his people. So keep that in mind. That's uh, some encouragement that we all can, to, can glean from. Uh, God has a promise for all of us. 
And if you're one of his, he's definitely faithful to us. You know, you can you can take what God says to the bank. You know, you can stand on it. You can you can be reassured that whatever he tells you is true. You can believe it and it's going to come to pass. Now, that's another thing about God's timing. God's timing and our timing uh, don't always line up. You know, God's timing is not our timing. We may think um, we're supposed to get what we're asking for or what he's promised us. He might talk about uh, five years from now, and we may expect it or want it tomorrow. So that's something else to be mindful of. Genesis uh, chapter 37, the same chapter, but verses 10 and 11, it reads like this. Um, this is, again, from the Living Translation. So mine reads a little bit different. It says, <clears throat> this time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? He asked, will your mother and I, your brothers, actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Uh, and I'll just jump down to uh, number uh, three in this particular uh, outline here. Well, no, I'll start from the beginning. It says, have you ever felt envious or jealous of someone else's family? Maybe you thought your life would be easier or better if you had a family like that. Kind of puts you in the mind of, uh, for example, the Hustables, how their family was just so perfect. You know, the dad was a doctor, the mom was a lawyer, and the kids were well off. But, you know, of course, a couple of them were spoiled and things like that. So that's just to give you a, an idea of how uh, some families uh, can look prominent or promising on the outside. You know, you may want your family to be like the Huxables. I don't know. Um, maybe you thought you could be more successful or even able to accomplish something great in the kingdom of God if you were just in a different situation. Number two says, well, Joseph had a tough family situation, too. In just a few moments, we will see exactly how rough things were for him. Look at what happened when Joseph dreamed his second dream. And that's the dream we just mentioned about uh, in, in verses 10 and 11. Number three says, Joseph's brothers envy him. But his father tucked away everything Joseph had said in his mind. Why? because Joseph was not the only one in his family who had ever dreamed a dream. Joseph's father had dreamed about a ladder going to heaven with angels ascending and descending that ladder. Jacob was well aware that not all dreams come from a wild imagination. Some come from God. Number four says, perhaps Jacob began realizing before anyone else that in the middle of their dysfunctional situation, God was placing a very special calling on Joseph's life. Number five says, God can still work in the middle of dysfunction. <clears throat> and I'll repeat that. God can still work in the middle of dysfunction. No matter what your family situation may look like, God still cares deeply about you and he has a very specific plan for your life. If you will open, now this is something that we have to do. If you will open your spirit up to him and trust him to lead you, he can do something incredible through you, no matter the situation in which you find yourself in. Um, Again, from uh, chapter 37, verses 10 and 11. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is, that, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to, thee, to the earth? And his brother, brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. 
So Joseph's brothers envied him. But his father again tucked away everything Joseph said in his mind. Why? Because Joseph was not the only one in his family who had ever dreamed a dream. So they repeated it again. It sounds repetitive, but I guess they're trying to drive this home. Um, number two, it says God can still work in the middle of this function. A, no matter what your family situation may look like, God still cares deeply about you. And he has a very specific plan for your life. And then it talks about, again, opening up your spirit to him and trusting him to lead you. He can do some incredible things through you. Number three says, at times you might feel like your family distracts you from God and his plan for your life. You might feel like the rules of your house or expectations of your family don't line up with that you want to do. And many of us, we live in homes where uh, we may be the only ones saved. Uh, some live, some of us have lived in households where our parents were saved. Uh, I didn't come from that type of household, but some of us have. And when your parents are saved, of course, their lives, uh, lifestyles are completely different. So as a result, some of the rules uh, that you have to follow are different than some of your other friends. Like they may get to, to hang out all times of the night and uh, stay up and, and go to school uh, the next morning with like two, three hours of sleep because they've been up all night or however the case may be. So the rules that God has in place uh, are for a reason. So if you're in that house type of household now, your parents are saved and they live by a different standard, um, it will benefit you later if you just trust the process. You may not agree with it now because it may feel like it's so popular. You know, the world today is much different than when I was a child. Um, even today, they're calling wrong right and right wrong. I can remember watching TV as a child and many of the shows, uh, they barely showed couples in the bed together. You know, um, they may have went to sleep and woke up the next day, but there wasn't any um, uh, sexual scenes or they weren't kissing on TV and all of that. Nowadays, all you got to do is turn on the TV and... Um, you see everything, man. You see everything. And I watch uh, sports and even some of the commercials, man, that come on while uh, I'm watching sports are despicable. And, you know, a lot of times you got to kind of keep that remote control close so you can either mute the TV or change the channel or, or something because uh, it's just they have no, no, no boundaries, you know, as for what they put out there for our children these days. And I believe I mentioned it before in a, a previous lesson about some of the entertainment that they call entertainment that we um, are supposed, well, we allow our children to uh, entertain themselves with. Some of them, the games uh, that they play, many of the games, a lot of the music that they listen to. You know, we understand that our eyes and our ears are gateways to our spirit, man. So we have to be mindful and careful of what we're putting out there, what we're allowing our children to feed themselves. Now, them as being children, they don't understand. They just say, hey, this game, um, it's a popular game, mom or dad. I want this game and I want the new uh, GTA, GTA game, you know, and. Uh, I'm just using that game as an example, and if any one of your children had the game, don't be offended. I'm just, you know, saying what is, is needed to be said, basically, because uh, I have a, a child right now um, who will be 13 years old in a couple of days here, and uh, I monitor. I have to monitor much more now than I did when my older children were younger because more things are accessible via internet right now. Um, right now, my son is, uh, he's, he's barred from, um, he doesn't have a social media page. I'm not allowing that. And then right now he's barred. He can't go on YouTube or anything. Uh, of that nature as of right now because of some things that he was watching that were inappropriate. Uh, so a lot of us 
uh, as parents this day and age, we have to be mindful and monitor what our kids are watching and what they're listening to, what type of shows that we allow them to watch. Uh, one show, and I feel it's totally offensive, is The Modern Family, you know, where they allow uh, homosexuals to live together and then they even have children and they're displaying it as this is the normal, you know, uh, it's okay for, you know, two same-sex individuals to live together and even raise children. So it totally goes against biblical teaching because God said he created man and woman to come together and reproduce. Well, newsflash, two women can't reproduce, two men can't reproduce, and I'll just leave that there so you can think about that. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know why I went that way, but I'm just uh, just trying to paint a picture for you guys, and I'm trying to help someone along the way. Um, it says, family dysfunction will happen, but if we are determined to overcome it and love our families, glorifying God in the process, we will overcome dysfunction and walk into the future God has planned for us. Um, again, it says the devotional, the daily devotional insight says the devotional focus this week has to do with our faith and willingness to believe God's promises. God's plan for you is bigger than you could ever imagine. Trust in him and never doubt that he wants the absolute best for your lives. And, um, on that note, uh, some things that we go through or that we have to endure, uh, it doesn't feel good. It's not always going to feel good. Um, and even with that being said, uh, it's uncomfortable at times. But sometimes God allows things to happen to take us out of our comfort zone, you know, to... Uh, to mold and shape us. I hear a lot of times they talk about the potter's wheel and how uh, when they, they, they're making something or they're shaping something and they mess up, well, they, they start completely over and they start from scratch and they begin to mold and shape that thing until it becomes what they're trying to make. So uh, right now we're on the potter's wheel and God is the master potter. So he knows uh, what he wants, he knows what's in us. For 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 one, God knows exactly what's in us. He knows how to get it out of us, and uh, his his mind is so beyond ours, so we can't begin to fathom some of the things that God can. So, uh, subtopic B says Joseph's brothers plotted to hurt him. When you think of the word dreamer, what comes to your mind? Maybe you think of someone who is creative. Maybe you think of someone who has great ideas. Maybe you think of someone who sets, sets big goals and believes in those goals. And maybe, though, you think of someone who is out of touch with reality, who refuses to see things for the way they really are. Those are just some examples of how or what comes to mind when you think of a dreamer. Number two says, well, Joseph's brothers did not have a high opinion of his dreams. Now, who would have a high opinion of someone's dreams if they dream saying that you're going to bow down before them and even your parents going to bow down before them? You would look at them a little bit strange, too, or it may, it may uh, provoke some, some jealousy or some anger in you. So you got to look at it from both aspects. Although God was using him and giving him these dreams, think about the flip side of that. You know, if it was you in the natural, how you would feel if your little brother came to you or your little sister, or even your, one of your little cousins or somebody came. Now, even though God gave them that dream, but just think about how you would feel and how your, you know, your mind would react. Genesis 37 and 19 says, And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. So they saw him coming and said, Here he come. Number three, Joseph's brothers called him a dreamer, 
but it was not a compliment. They were mocking him. Have you ever had somebody who tried to uh, to kind of like compliment you, but throw shade at the same time? You know, oh, you got that promotion, huh? Oh, that's your new car out there? Mm. You know, just things like that, but it's subtle, but they the way they, they're intending it is not a compliment. It's like, like really throwing shade. It says, Joseph's brothers called him a dreamer, but it was not a compliment. They were mocking him. A says, here comes the guy who thinks he's better than us. B says, he thinks he's closer to God than us. C, this guy thinks he's more special than us. Now, these are all natural um, feelings and thoughts that just popped up in their mind, but that's they come from jealousy and envy, if you want to just be real about it. They did not believe in him. Rather, they hated him. Now, you got people hating you because of your relationship with God or because of your closeness with God when we all have that opportunity, you know, of, of you, if I'm praying and fasting to get closer to God, guess what? You have that same luxury. You can pray and fast uh, to get closer to God, but the drive behind it has to be, um, it has to be something from within, you know, a desire that you have, not because someone else is doing it. So you seeing that they're benefiting from it. So now you want to try it. No, it's a personal thing that you have to do because you want it, not because uh, you see somebody else benefiting from that. It says, uh, number five says, if you were, if you are sensitive to the Holy Ghost, God will place dreams and desires in your heart for things he wants to see you accomplish in your life and in his kingdom. Many times this will be big. Incredible things that seem difficult or impossible without him. A says some people will celebrate the things God is doing in your life, but not everyone. Some people will mock mock you or even hate you for your dreams. In fact, some will go so far as to try to kill your dreams. Now just think about that. Let that let that marinate for a minute. These are your dreams and aspirations that God has given you. And because you share them with somebody else, some people will even try to kill your dreams. So you have to be careful also what you share with somebody. Just because God has given you some things, some dreams or whatever, be careful of who you share those dreams with. Because not everybody's going to be happy for you. Not everybody's going to um, uh, want to see you excel or, or, or do better than them, you know, so to speak. So you have to be mindful of that. So... Uh, Dropping down to uh, Genesis, the 37th chapter, down to verses 20 and 22. And again, this is from the National, uh, the, the New Living Translation, I'm sorry. It says, uh, verse 20, it says, Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So, although the other brothers wanted to see him physically dead, although Reuben didn't agree with the dreams either, but he didn't want to see his brother killed. You know, I guess Reuben, the, the one that had a little bit of compassion because um, 
he did realize the relationship and how much his father loved uh, his brother. And he possibly thought about, you know, what that would do to his father. A lot of times uh, we have to think about the other person's feelings. So if I'm going to go and say something, you know, I have to think twice about what I'm saying before I say it and not just blurt out something and then have to suffer the consequences later. You know, think about what you're going to say. Take a half a second, uh, maybe a whole second <laughs> to think about what you're about to say before you say it. Think about how you're saying it. And also think about how the next person might receive what you're saying. So, yeah, words, man, they can be very tricky. They can build you up or they can tear you down. So we have to be uh, mindful and careful of that as well. Number six, it says, initially, Joseph's brothers were so angry that they talked about ending his life just so they could kill his dreams. Now, they want to kill this man just so they can kill his dreams, okay? Their brother Reuben saved Joseph's life, but Reuben had the same goal. Reuben did not want to murder. He did not want murder on his conscience, but he wanted to kill Joseph's dreams too. B says, as a result, the, others, the other brothers threw Joseph into a pit. Number seven asks us a question here. It says, have you ever felt like you have been thrown into a pit? A says, maybe you told someone about what Jesus was doing in your life, but that person just made fun of you. B says, maybe you told someone about all the things you want to accomplish for God, but that person sneered at you. Hmm. C says, maybe you talked about your dream to be a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer, and someone says, you don't even have the grades for that. There is no way you are smart enough. Number eight says, people may not physically throw us into a pit, but they do so, I'm sorry, they do sometimes try to cast down our dreams. Even people with good intentions who are just trying to get us to see reality can cast our dreams into a pit. Number nine says, Joseph's brothers did not stop there, though. If throwing him into a pit wasn't bad enough, what they did next was even worse. So drop down to Genesis chapter 37, but verse number 28. And again, this is from the, the Living Translation. It says, So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. Now, we know later on that this all was a part of God's plan, but we see the motive behind uh, what transpired here. And it was all fueled by jealousy and envy, you know. Um, and those same uh, motivations motivate people today. You know, not everybody is happy for you. Uh, not everybody wants to see you succeed. So sometimes, um, well, not sometimes, but all the time, we have to be careful of the company we keep. And sometimes, yeah, you got to cut off some people, um, even family, for a period of time, if not permanently, who um, seem like a hindrance to you. You know, uh, God is going to get the glory regardless, but sometimes uh, we can hinder ourselves. I'll just say it like that. We can hinder ourselves by the company we keep. If I'm a positive, upbeat person, why do I want to have somebody around me that's always gloomy and negative? Uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a young lady on my job, and all she does is complain, complain, complain. So uh, we just celebrated our third year anniversary uh, for our company being in existence. And uh, they sent out a text to all of the leads. They're asking... Um, 
all of us to uh, give a nomination to a, a driver or individual uh, that has excelled in something and we want to honor them. Well, it was funny because one of the leads say, can we give that young lady uh, an accolade for being the biggest pain in the butt or the biggest complainer? So I got a I got a, a big laugh out of that, and I thought about it. And you know, every time I think about her, I picture her face. But all she does is complain. Um, so why would I constantly want somebody around me that all they do is complain, or their their energy is negative, or uh, their spirit is always you know um, different, you know, different than than mine. Uh, me personally, um, I'm, I'm kind of laid back and um, I like to go with the flow sometimes. Well, a lot of times uh, our personalities may uh, not agree with somebody. They might conflict with somebody else's, you know, the way they carry themselves or the way they even think about their outlook on things. Um, now, I do know this, that everybody's personality is different. Um, so we deal with people, uh, on, on, on different levels, even with our children. I had, uh, growing up, my children all in the household, but everybody's personality was completely different. For example, I had a daughter who I could yell at, raise my voice, and, uh, she would cry or her feelings would be hurt. She would do what I asked her to do. Well, another one just, she wouldn't listen regardless. She was going to do what she wanted to do and had to suffer the consequences later. So um, I said all that to say that, you know, we have to deal with uh, our children all on uh, different levels. Now, the rules may be the same. I'm not saying you're supposed to set uh, rules to be different for, for different children. The rules have to be the same, but maybe our approach or our um, discipline may vary according to the individual like if you got a child that um they love uh the internet or their their cellular device or whatever they have um you take that away from them well that's like that hurts them as as bad as if they got physical discipline uh i've seen a little a little child that was uh, so content with their parents' phone and just, they just, I think the kid was like two years old, could navigate through the phone and pull up uh, everything, go to the internet and watch what they wanted to watch. And they give it to the kid just to get the kid, you know, out of their face or to keep to let them be content while they do whatever they're doing, whether they be cooking or whatever. But I'll say it again, we have to be, uh, we have to monitor what we're allowing our children to take in through their eye gates and their ear gates. Um, it says, uh, number 10 says, <clears throat> Joseph's brothers wanted to be free from him and his dreams, so they sold him into slavery. He was bound and taken away to a foreign country. Number 11 says, Joseph's brothers lied to their father. They tore up Joseph's coat and smeared animal blood on it to convince Jacob that Joseph was dead. Our adversary, the devil, wants to do more than just throw our dreams down into a pit. He wants to sell us off into slavery as well. Satan cannot literally sell us into slavery, but he wants to make sure our dreams are enslaved. He does this in several ways. The first way Satan tries to enslave our dreams is to get us to have selfish motives for our dreams, talents, and abilities. Like, uh, because you can, uh, you're, you're, you're a good singer, well, he might want you to, I mean, he might convince you that you can sing better than sister so-and-so. Why she leading the song every Sunday and I sing better than her, you know. So, you know, it's just things like that, little subtle things, but they can blow up and they can be bigger and then they get planted in your heart. It's just like a seed planted. It's got to grow. It's going to grow if it's planted in the right soil. But all the time, uh, what feeds that, that seed is not good soil, so to speak. Have you ever seen people with great power, authority, or ability 
but they use those things for their own benefit. Maybe someone in your class is really smart, but she or he still will not help others with their work, their homework, because they want the highest grade in the class. Number two, maybe someone is a star on a team, but will not help the other players. Number three, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe someone has incredible musical talent, but they only use only uses that talent outside of church instead of using it for God's kingdom. B says, <clears throat> excuse me, God gave us our dreams to accomplish great things for his kingdom and for our community. He formed us to make a difference in our world. If C says, if the enemy can distract us by getting us to focus on ourselves, he can keep us from living out our dreams the way God intended. Uh, so, you know, just I'm hoping you all taking all this in and I'm hoping that this is helping someone. It says the other way the enemy tries to enslave our dreams is by convincing us we are not good enough. He wants to convince us that A, dysfunction in our families like Joseph had and his will disqualify us. B, the doubters are right. We are not smart enough, talented enough, and so on. C, we may have made a lot of mistakes. D says, our dreams are simply too big, too great, or too awesome for us to accomplish them. So why even try? Excuse me, I don't know if any of you all may have had any of those thoughts, but um, they're very common and don't feel bad if you've ever had any of these thoughts, but these are thoughts that uh, are, are planted, you know, in our minds. And as being human beings, we, we think different things. We're not always thinking on uh, a spiritual level. We don't always have a spiritual mindset. So that's why God's word encourages us, let this mind be in, in us that's also was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, we have to constantly think on those things. We have to apply the scriptures that we have and that we've read, these Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies, uh, the daily devotions. Those are all food for thought in the way we feed our spirit and we keep our mind from drifting off or being overwhelmed by the negative thoughts that's going to enter our minds on a daily basis. Um, number 14 says, here is the truth, though. It does not matter what your peers, your doubters, your problems, or even your own opinion says about you. What matters is what God says about you. God is true, and everyone who disagrees with him is wrong. Uh, and you want a scripture to back that up, I have one. It's Romans chapter 3, verse 7. And it simply reads like this. It says, and this is the, the living translation once again. Uh, I'm sorry, 3 and 4. So back up to verse 4. It says, uh, of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true as the scriptures say about him. You will be proved right in what you say, and you will win your case in court. Um, A says, you must be willing to believe what God, you have to believe that what God says about you is true, even when others do not believe it. So even if nobody else don't believe what you know God says, you got to believe God over your mom, <laughs> your dad, and Everyone else for that matter. Amen. Okay. Uh, B says, you may look at your life and not understand how God could possibly bring your dreams to pass. But if you will trust and follow after his call, you will see him do great things in your life. Moving right along here, it says, uh, this is uh, in the release, option number one. 
It says, number one, it says, God loves you with a perfect love. He loves you in spite of your flaws. He does not expect you to be perfect. And he does not cast you away because of your imperfections. Anybody have any imperfections? I raise my hand because I do. I know I'm not uh, all that in the bag of flaming hots like Bishop uh, used to, likes to say. Um, so I, I know that there's work that needs to be done in me. But um, I'm, in, I'm, I'm admitting that to myself. You know, uh, you have to admit to yourself that you're not all that and you don't have it all together. And even if you have yourself together in one area, well, there's always another area where we can use some work. I know my thoughts are not always uh, the best um, in driving uh, right now for a living. Uh, somebody speed up just to jump in front of you and, and get caught at the same light or just watching how other people are so in a hurry. Uh, it can be frustrating. And so I'm practicing now, even when somebody does something like that, not to react uh, out of my flesh. You know what I'm saying? It, it takes practice and discipline, but it's something that I'm working on. And I'm just sharing me with you guys. Um, so, and then also I'm practicing, you know how <laughs> somebody may do something that appears to be, uh, not the wisest thing and you get over and you get pull up next to them and you want to look over at them to kind of like see what were you thinking or let them know that what what they did you didn't agree with so i'm practicing not even looking over there i just try to keep my my eyes focused on the road and just keep on driving it says a says living for god is about growing closer to him each day the closer you get to Jesus, the more you will understand just how favorably he looks upon you. Uh, and I and me now, even now walking around, I expect favor. You know, uh, I do know that God. Um, he blesses faithfulness. So right now uh, I'm, I'm doing all I know to do to be faithful to God. You know, it's not all, it doesn't always feel good, but hey, that's that's the practice that I'm practicing because I want God's favor. Uh, I want my prayers answered. Uh, I want to be in good standing with God and just seeing so many people leaving this world left and right every five minutes seem like. Um, I want to make sure that when my time is up that God is pleased with me. You know, I want to hear him say, well done, that good and faithful servant. I don't want to say, uh, be cast you away from me. I never knew you. I say, hey man, I, I, I did all this stuff in your name. Man, cast him away. I never knew you. Just think about that. It says, B says, in order to reject what others say about you and embrace what God says about you, you need to get closer to Him and His Word. Uh, we are all equal in God's eyes, and we must stay humble before Him. Uh, I thought that was very important, so I made sure to highlight that we are all equal in God's eyes, and we must stay humble before God. Um, it says he will, oh, this is talking about our enemies here. It says uh, he will discourage us if he can. If the enemy cannot discourage us, though sometimes he will try a different tactic, he may tell us how great we are. He may try to get us to believe that God chose us because we are somehow more special and powerful or holy than others around us. If the devil cannot convince us that we are terrible people, he may try instead to inflate our ego to believe we are superior to others. You ever seen somebody get promoted on your job and get a big head? You ever see somebody in the world that think they better than you because they may be more well off than you? Well, those are tactics that the enemy uses as well. Sometimes he'll try to tear you down. Most of the time he'll try to tear you down. But there's other times where he'll try to build you up to the point where you get your chest poked out and you think you're better than other people and you start to look down on other people. Um... Uh, 
be careful who you look down at because you can be down there as well. You know, you can end up in that same position that other people are, are in. So on that note, um, I hope this lesson uh, helps someone. I hope you got something out of this lesson, which is my prayer that, you know, I help someone. Uh, I share a lot about myself because I want to appear, I want to be transparent. Um, I'm not ashamed of my past, the mistakes I made, but God still chose me and saved me. And if God chose and saved me, I want to give somebody else some encouragement and some hope that if God chose to save me, he can save you as well. You know, my background is not squeaky clean. Actually, my background is, is very dirty. <laughs> but uh, I thank God for his grace and his mercy for choosing me in spite of my flaws and uh, my imperfections. So someone out there that may be listening you know, I hope this was inspiring and encouraging to you. If there's someone who's having um, doubts and thoughts about your future or what God told you, you got to remember that what God gave you, everybody's not going to uh, agree with that or want to push you forward. They may try to tear you down. But what you can be assured is if God gave it to you, he gave it to you for a reason. And it will and can come to pass, but there's sometimes there's some things that we need to do in order for that to happen. Um, there was something that I, I, I wrote down here I wanted to share. Uh, I think we may have a couple of seconds left, so I'll be real quick. It says a spiritual dress code. Before we start rebuking, resisting the devil, we must ask ourselves if we've submitted to God. Submitting to God means fully abandoning our lives to him with our spiritual armor fully in place and prayer in our hearts. We're yielding to the one who has the ultimate authority. We're given the strength to resist the devil when we surrender our entire lives to God. And then guess what happens? He flees. Resisting the devil is hard when we haven't submitted our will our ways, and our wants to God. Submitting to God is not only the first step, but our submission to God is actually us resisting Satan at the same time. We have the tools at hand. Let's take steps toward fully giving li our lives to our God, for when we do, the enemy has no power over us. So on that note, I'll close out this particular Sunday school lesson. And uh, um, what I will say is that um, it's been a pleasure and I find it uh, a privilege to do anything for God. So I stand before you, I sit here before you today uh, with complete humility. And I thank God for even allowing me this opportunity. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope, you know, this was helpful. And again, this was uh, our Sunday School Teen Edition, and we'll be doing this every first Friday of the month. Uh, on that note, I will say this. Um, we have uh, our virtual annual council coming up, and it'll begin this week, April 5th through the 9th. Uh, there's flyers posted all over uh, social media, and then if uh, you're tuned in to our uh, Zion Temple uh, youth uh, page, uh, it's there as well. And then we also have uh, uh, in August, August 1st through the 6th, it's our 107 PAW uh, Annual International Summer Convention. And so, and that's going to be held in St. Louis, Missouri. So we always try to support uh, these uh, these uh, movements because, uh, for one, our pastor is uh, the chairman of the state of Indiana. So we want to represent God first, but then our pastor as well. So on that note, uh, I'll end with the word of prayer. Again, thank you all for listening. And just let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for 
again, your love, your kindness, your grace and mercy towards us. We thank you, Lord God, for the avenues that you've given us, Lord God, to get your word out to the world. Lord God, I find it uh, very humbling, Lord God, and inspiring that you chose to use me. I thank you, Lord God, for who you are in my life. I thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. Oh God, I bless, honor, and praise your holy name. Lord God, touch someone on today. Allow this word to marinate in someone's heart, Lord God, that someone's life may be changed, and ultimately someone may decide to give their life over unto you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. See you next time. Be blessed.